Join thousands of others on this podcast and on our site, touchmba.com, as they seek the admissions edge. And now, here's your host, Darren Joe. Hey, 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 it is Darren. Welcome back to the Touch MBA podcast. <laughs> Thanks for listening, y'all. Really appreciate it. I'm really excited to present this week's interview to you. It's with Dr. Michelle Roberts, who is the MBA Academic Director for the Australian Graduate School of Management, otherwise known as AGSM, at the University of New South Wales, or UNSW. And this is one of Australia's top MBA programs. I think, though, that anyone could really benefit from this podcast, not just those of you looking to apply to top schools in Australia, because Dr. Michelle really breaks down how the admissions process works and how you can really perform better in the interview, present your case, present your story to admissions officers. I think this episode in particular is really packed full of, of great tips there. So yeah, I hope you enjoy our discussion about the AGSM MBA. It sounds pretty amazing. And I've never been to Sydney, but now I really want to go <laughs> to Sydney, Australia, once this whole pandemic is over, hopefully. So anyways, I hope you enjoy our discussion. And remember that at Touch MBA, you can get free school selection help. That's how we're trying to make a difference in this space by guiding you towards best fit schools and making this whole process a bit less daunting. So you can submit your profile over at touchmba.com and we'd be happy to give you some pointers for free over there. We also have a guide where you can look at Australia's top MBA programs and see them side by side. Yeah, compare them head to head. And that's available at touchmba.com slash guides. All right. And now on to my talk with Dr. Michelle Roberts. So it is my pleasure to introduce uh, my next guest to the Touch MBA podcast. She is the MBA Academic Director for the Australian Graduate School of Management at the University of New South Wales. This university is based in Sydney. So I'm so excited to have Dr. Michelle Roberts on the show. Dr. Michelle, thank you so much for, co for coming on the Touch MBA podcast. Hey, Darren, thank you for having me on the show. It's great to be with you. <laughs> yes. And Dr. Michelle, I know you have extensive experience in running many different parts of this program and being involved in many different parts of this program. So could you just please give our audience a little background of your involvement with AGSM MBA? Yeah, sure. So I joined AGSM about three years ago from another Australian uh, MBA program. And I came here originally to look after the part-time MBA programs. So that's MBA X, our online MBA, our executive MBA, and then um, Actually, I, I then moved into the role of academic director. So now I look after the full-time MBA and, and all of our, our programs at AGSM. Wow. And you teach as well, right? That's right. Yeah, I teach marketing. And uh, I also, I was teaching yesterday, taught power and influence, wow. and strategic networking, and a little bit of digital. Wow. So if if an applicant gets into the program, they'll not only see you on the the front end admission side, but on the back end in the program as well, taking classes. From yeah, that's you. right. There is, <laughs> there is no dodging me. <laughs> yeah, I take the first course in the MBA Foundations wow. of Management. Yes. So it's kind of like a, a sort of a boot camp, um, which is an extraordinary thing that I, I've kind of um, been involved in for a few years and absolutely love. We take them at the start for a kind of three week skill uplift where we we teach them problem solving and uh, bulletproof problem solving with the former Dean of AGSM is also the former head of McKinsey Australia and he teaches complex problem solving. We teach them presence and communication with some actors from NIDA, our uh, Institute of Dramatic Arts. And um, we also teach them responsible management with um, 
one of our professors of practice, who's probably Australia's leading philosopher and, and um, thought leader who advises many boards on responsible management. He takes them for a few days on, on how to think about these problems and, and find ways through these complex problems in a responsible way. Um, and then we teach them leadership with the former commanding officer of special forces in Australia. And we actually take them out in the Australian bush and we spend a few days there with um, with a bunch of former special forces officers. And um, we do an incredible experience that we call ALICE, Adaptive Leadership in Complex Environments. And it sounds crazy, but we do things like um, sleep deprivation, calorie restriction, a lot of really complex problem solving under enormous pressure. And although the students are certainly very scared on the, on the bus on the way on the way there, um, they really do not want to get back on the bus and, and come home at the end of it. They say that it changes their life and it's incredibly transformative. And all of a sudden you realize what you're capable of and you realize that no matter what comes at you, you have always got the ability to just go a little further, that you can cope with anything that is thrown at you and still come out with good outcomes. So I think students' sense of their own abilities is absolutely transformed on that experience. And of course, it just bonds the cohort incredibly. Nothing bonds a group other than dealing with a challenging situation and getting through an adverse situation together. Um, so it's a really beautiful experience at the start of our, our full-time MBA. Yeah, it sounds like it really sets the tone. And I love how you bring in people from all walks of life to to teach about leadership. I mean, that, yeah, personally, I think that's so necessary too. And I mean, is that kind of the main focus of the program, leadership? Or I, I'd love to hear your opinions on, you know, what do you think makes this MBA unique, right, from all the other top ranked programs in the world? Yeah, look, I think actually something you touched on there is part of the special source of AGSM, and that's bringing in a whole lot of people. You know, it, it does take a village to build a really wonderful MBA. And at AGSM, we have 90 adjuncts who are working in industry and come in to teach the MBAs. So it's this incredible hybrid of one of the world's top universities and academics who are ranked at the top of their field, creating material and and co-creating it and co-delivering it with industry practitioners. So you you know you'll do finance with someone from Macquarie Bank. You will learn strategy from people at McKinsey. You will really get to be with people who are consulting and advising to some of the world's best businesses and NGOs. And so it kind of translates the content at the point of delivery. And, you know, it's delivered in a way that look, this is how I use this in my work and this is what different companies have done with this and this is where they struggle. So it, it's very real having, you know, a, such a large uh, sessional group of, of faculty there, 90 different faculty um, who are working in industry combined with the business school. It's just this incredible sweet spot in MBA teaching. Wow. So and your full time MBA cohort has about. 50 students in it, right? Roughly? Yes, that's right. Yeah. So uh, we, there's, we're usually around 50. So it's an incredibly small program. Yeah. So there's almost twice as many adjunct faculty as students. Uh, that's right. So they're teaching across all MBA programs. But yes, yeah, yeah, we have a, a large faculty and I guess you would say small class sizes. We generally in our core, we have about 40 to 50 students. And then in our electives, we have maybe 25 students. I think, you know, another thing that really, really is extraordinary about AJSM is the opportunity to have a truly global experience. So over half the cohort, probably 70% of the cohort will do a quarter of their MBA overseas at one of our global partner schools. So we're part of the PIM network. So the main schools that our students go to are Kellogg, Chicago Booth, NYU Stern, London Business School, IE, Bocconi, but probably the US schools and London Business School are where about 70% of the cohort will go for their final fourth quarter of the program. And then in addition to going to these extraordinary schools, we're part of the 
Global Network for Advanced Management, which is run by Yale University. There's one school from each country that's a member school. And three times a year, the students will go to one of the other, have the opportunity to go to one of the other schools in the network and do a week, an elective course in a one week intensive that has all this wonderful social and cultural experience wrapped around that week. And you're in a classroom with students from all over the world, from Yale, from UC Berkeley, from Oxford. Oxford University, from IE, and they all come together for this one week of a really leading edge, edge subject. And you get that opportunity three times a year. So I would say the majority, probably 80% of our full-time cohort will also do a global network week. And that's a really extraordinary opportunity to do a leading edge topic, like you could do behavioral science at Yale, you could do innovation in the Bay Area at, uh, at UC Berkeley. So these are, are ways that you have a really global experience when you're with us. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And and you're paying AGSM MBA tuition for that, right? Yeah, yeah you noticed that. That's right. <laughs> I think this is so important, you know, for for listeners to understand, like uh, the, the tuition at AGSM or a, a lot of Asian business schools is significantly lower than that of the U.S., but you get to go on these exchanges. So I, I think that's right. that's a fantastic v value, you know. I think you know doing your MBA in in Asia Pac is is really very very affordable for what you can get in the program. You know, a quarter of your program at a leading school in the US or, or the UK, and then the opportunity to do your your global network weeks. And again, throughout Asia, we have a lot of Asian schools in the global network, um, such as Fudan, HCUST which will give you that incredible opportunity of, of gaining some exposure in, in Asia. Absolutely. And so as a professor at, at the school, you know, where academically does, does AGSM really stand out? Okay, so in terms of things that we are kind of, well, in, so in terms of AGSM's reputation and our rankings, um, our online MBA, MBAX, is ranked fourth in the world. Wow. EMBA is ranked 10th in Asia Pacific. Our full-time MBA is um, ranked as one of the top two business schools in Asia by Forbes. Uh, it's ranked number eighth in the world. So the MBA is ranked obviously, you know, consistently. It was the first MBA in Australia to be ranked, and it's been ranked as a top program ever since um, we were created over 40 years ago. In terms of the university that we're part of, UNSW, and, and I should say people think about AGSM, but we're very much embedded within the university ecosystem. And it's an incredible university at UNSW. It's ranked 44th in the world. It's the top university in Australia for founders. We have more founders than any other Australian university. We have more CEOs in the Fortune 500 than any other Australian university. We have more millionaires than any other Australian university. So it's a real um, powerhouse. It's actually a STEM powerhouse, UNSW. And, you know, the business school that we are embedded within, we're a school of the business school, is ranked number one in the world for, for risk and for actuarial studies. It's ranked 15th in the world for finance and accounting. Um, first in Australia, it's ranked 34th in the world for business and management, second in Australia. So you're embedded within a place of academic excellence, which I think really, really matters. And I think you know, some of the other things that we have got a reputation for probably as a school, one would be disruption. We really sort of um, focused on that very early. And so we have an MBA with a specialization in technology. We have um, graduate certificates in technology management, graduate certificate in digital innovation. And what this means is that there are a lot of courses in digital and disruption that are really going to set you up well for the future of work. We have a lot of kind of thought leaders and faculty who focus really hard on these issues, and that means that we've we've developed a reputation for for that kind of focus. Um, and I think the other thing that we're really known for is diversity and inclusion. We're one of the well, we are the only school um, in Asia Pacific that are a member of the Romba Network, Reach Out MBA, the LGBTIQ Student Network. So we were the only school to be accepted uh, in Asia Pac. We have the only scholarships in Asia Pacific, I believe, 
for LGBTI students. And we're one of only a handful of schools in the world that have 50% gender equality in our MBA cohort. I noticed that. I mean, that last one was striking, maybe not as uh, pioneering as, as some of the other diversity initiatives you mentioned. But yeah, I was like, wow, it's about time. <laughs> yeah. So that's it fantastic. That's fantastic. Thank you for giving you know, us more background of the school, because I, I think that's really important to, to, to always know, right? Like, what is the reputation of the university that these business schools are housed in? Because you're also going to carry that with you for the rest of your life. Yeah. Could we talk about the option that you guys have to do the MBA extension, uh, with yes. which is either a research project or internship, I believe, and and... Could you tell us like how many of your full-time MBAs decide to do that roughly and, and what that entails? Yeah, right. Now, that's a really important piece for students coming from overseas because that would allow you to have studied with us long enough to be eligible for the post-study work visa ah, in Australia. Yeah. yeah. So, we have a short MBA. It's, it's 15 months, although we do have people complete it within 12 months within a year. And so, for some people, they want something longer than that. I think if you're making, you know, what we all call the triple pike, mm. um, where <laughs> yeah. you're changing role, industry, and country, a lot of those people feel like they need longer um, to be ready to make such a huge leap. A lot of people who are aiming for one of their tier one strategy consulting companies, they just need a little bit longer to be ready. And so, if you do need longer, then MBA extension really gives you that time. So you would complete your coursework in your MBA and you would then be able to stay and do a, a deep dive into an applied research project. Most of the students who do extension will be interned at a company for the whole time. And, and many of them will be earning um, a salary during that time in their internship. Some students might choose for a variety of reasons to do a research project on a topic of particular interest that they want to develop some thought leadership and some subject matter expertise on. And so that, that really is an option to you. You'll have an academic supervisor for the whole time and we'll really tailor make an academic journey for you throughout your extension. I would say most students who join us at least think that they might want to do extension and certainly about midway through the MBA, half of them still think they would like to do that. But then a lot of them get job offers and um, life gets in the way. And, and we probably end up with about a third to a quarter of our students will do extension. But it, it's an option that's open to, to everyone. Yeah, I mean, and so while we're on the topic, how, how does the visa work? Like, uh, so, um, yeah, how long can students stay in the country to, to look for jobs? So... We actually, in, in Australia, we're, um, we have special visa advisors who really um, focus on this, and we try not to give a lot of visa advice. Partly totally because understand, we're, yeah. Yeah, we're not really the experts on that. And also, we're not supposed to advise students um, for really good reasons, and that is that visa laws change and we might give you the wrong advice. So, one thing that we do in our full-time MBA is that we – bring in one of the world's top visa advisory firms, Fragaman Migration uh, Lawyers, and Fragaman do a, one a, a briefing for the whole cohort on visa issues, and then they do individual one-on-one -on -one consults, and we provide all of that free of charge. So, uh, because visa laws do change, I would really encourage students to go and look up and, and get visa advice before they, they choose a program. But we certainly do make that advice available from experts once they're in the program. Yes. And what do students going through your program, like w what part of it, you know, aside from that, starting it, starting it out with such a bang, right, with that boot camp, um, <laughs> what else do they really love about the AGSM MBA? What have you um, heard? Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely. I think the the highlight is is doing Alice at the start. And then the things that I love, I they consistently say that they love being in a smaller cohort. So, 
you know, it, it is like a family. Everyone in the cohort has been really carefully chosen and curated to be there. They're all there for a purpose. Um, and so they do feel like they've been picked to be part of something bigger. You're all going to know each other very well. Uh, and that's been challenging during COVID. But because there's only 50 of you, you do feel more like a community than you would in a large program where you might be a little bit more unknown. As you walk around the corridors, everyone knows you by name and um, all of the faculty know you. And it's it's just a really important group of people to us. So I sent, I think that sense of belonging that alumni have for the program and that, that faculty have for the program is really important. I think diversity and inclusion is a very important part of our program. The year pretty much kicks off with the Mardi Gras Pride Parade. We always throw a party for that, the university march in that parade. And it, you know, just the, the, the sheer fun of it, I think very much positions our view on equality. Uh, and diversity and inclusion at UNSW, which is that we're doing this. <laughs> it's happening, but it's also going to be fun. And it's a very unifying force in our program. We run a lot of events and there is a real sense that you can bring your whole self and you will be included and valued. And it becomes something that we, we're all very, very passionate about. I think diversity and inclusion, we, we very much select for that. And it's something that unites us and bonds us quite closely. Apart from that, I think, you know, a lot of the, the electives that are popular are, are certainly the strategy courses and the tech courses are very popular. I think a really exciting part of the program, obviously the global footprint going away on exchange is, is exciting. And those global network weeks is something that creates a huge buzz and, and excitement. But Term three, I think, is, is a bit of a really special time because what happens in term one and term two can feel a little bit like we're really focused on content. And the reason that we do that is because term three, it really opens up. And so term three is when you should not have your, your nose in your books. You should not be hanging around on campus all the time. You should be out in the industry. So the electives that we run in term three, we have strategic consulting projects where you will be interned with a, a partner, a corporate partner, working on a high-level strategy problem. So the partners we work with are Microsoft, Unilever, Sephora, Commonwealth Bank, Westpac Bank. So, you know, global brands and brands of national profile, Qantas, where you're working on complex strategy problems for them for a whole term. And you're spending time at their offices, you're consulting and, and presenting back to their senior executives. So that's one of the electives you can do. Another elective is entrepreneurship from the inside. So if you are interested in startups, you can intern with a founder for credit and be learning um, advanced entrepreneurship concepts at the same time as being interned with a founder or, or at a, an incubator. And so, and you can also do, there's another kind, a third kind of elective that you can do for credit that is work integrated learning. So you're essentially doing an internship for credit. So okay. with all of that yeah. going on, um, term three, very much I feel like you've covered off a lot of the content, all of the core content, and now you're out there in industry applying it in applied projects, um, as well as doing a bit of a deep dive on subjects of interest to you. So it's an exciting, it's an exciting term. It's also the term when consulting week happens and recruiters start coming onto campus. Campus. Um, so that I think that's kind of a, a great a great time of energy and excitement. Yes. And how long do the terms last? Just so uh, yeah. twelve weeks. Oh, 12 weeks. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Yeah. So that's crystal clear. And so I also have to ask you about the location. In fact, before this interview, I I was watching YouTube videos of, of Sydney because I've never been there <laughs> to just oh. try to imagine myself, you know, in the city and uh, what it would be like. Could you tell us more about Sydney and why it would make sense as, as a destination to get a, a top-ranked MBA? Yeah, absolutely. Look, I was going to talk about economy, but since you mentioned <laughs> lifestyle, <laughs> well, that, I yeah. mean, it is it's hard to imagine. You know, I, I'm a Brit, so I, I never, it never gets old for me. <laughs> we walk to the beach every morning. Actually, during COVID, we've been walking to the beach twice a day. And it just, it never gets old. I mean, seeing your neighbors doing their supermarket shopping in a towel. 
<laughs> it's just it's so Sydney and I think it's so Sydney for two reasons it's it's the beachy lifestyle but it's also the relaxed vibe Australians work really hard but they also play incredibly hard and so time at the beach time outdoors is is just sacred to us and you know it is just sunshine every day of the year and um beautiful blue skies. It's really the only city that I've known. I've lived and worked in, in a number of cities around the world. And it's the only one that I've really experienced where, you know, you can be on Bondi Beach and 15 minutes later, you can be in the CBD. And that is an extraordinary value proposition. I mean, tomorrow uh, afternoon, as, as we hit Friday afternoon, I'll do what many Sydney siders will do, we'll jump in our car and we'll go to the Blue Mountains and we'll be in the Blue Mountains an hour and a half later. And it is one of the world's areas of outstanding beauty. And just that, I think that freedom really to go from the beach to the CBD to the mountains with such short distances, the quality of life is is absolutely extraordinary. And I, I had a really surreal experience during when COVID was at its worst in Sydney. Now we're back to campus and touch wood, we're, we're doing well. But when, when COVID was at its worst and we were in, uh, in real isolation and lockdown, I was sitting at the beach and, and worrying about my, my cohort and how are they feeling? Are they, you know, are they lonely? Are they stressed? And one of them run past me with a surfboard under his arm. <laughs> so I thought, oh, no, hang on. It's Sydney. <laughs> they, they're probably having a pretty good time. <laughs> so it, the, the lifestyle is extraordinary. But the economy, I think, is also very special. You know, it's the axis of the, the global. The axis of the global economy is shifting east. Asia now uh, accounts for a, a third of, of global GDP. Um, it's on track to be fifty percent GDP by twenty forty. Asia is expected to account for forty percent of the world's total consumption. It is really the area, the part of the world that you want to be in if you want to be in a way in a place where growth is accelerating. Sydney in particular is extraordinary. We have um, just in, in the city of Sydney alone, we have 7% of Australia's jobs, 140 billion generated. That's half a million jobs. We have 451,000 businesses that are based in the city of Sydney. We have 283 multinational companies that have regional offices in Sydney. Two-thirds of the world's regional headquarters of multinational organizations are based here in Sydney. And in the startup community, you know, this is the, the center of Australia's startup community. Most Australian startups are, are based here in Sydney. And there is just an extraordinary ecosystem that you can be part of and and a number of those Australia's most successful startups came out of UNSW are probably our most successful startup Atlassian and was founded as a student project in our business school. So it's an exciting place to be if you're trying to pursue a corporate career. You know, some of the tech sectors that we, so, sorry, some of the se sectors that we have represented here are tech, Media and marketing and finance are very, very strong. Consulting is obviously a, a major focus of jobs here in Sydney. But at the same time, it's a great place to be a founder and pursue a startup career. Yeah, I mean, is Sydney considered kind of like the, the financial capital or business center of Australia or am I mistaken? No, it is. It's the financial capital of Australia and, the, and that gateway into Asia too. Yeah. Okay. Wow. And I mean, because you mentioned it, I do have to ask about COVID-19 and how the program has yeah. adapted to that. What's going on? Yeah. Yes, yes. So it was a very bumpy ride for all of us throughout the world. But I think in some ways we were a little bit protected because we have got the world's oldest online MBA and an MBA that's ranked fourth in the world. And what that means is that we already have all of our MBA courses running online and we already have all of our faculty able to teach online. We have support teams there for online teaching. So, you know, we I think we found out on Wednesday that campus was closing and we had two days notice, but we, we instantly transferred to online. And so we live streamed and that worked very well for us because we had the technologies in place, the content in place and faculty who are very experienced online teachers. So that, that was fairly seamless for us. And, and indeed, student evaluations were very, very strong throughout that time of being online. 
it certainly was felt by the full-time cohort who had come a long way to be together. So, it, yeah, obviously it's not the same. We've done a lot to try and bond them and be together, but they were very relieved when campus reopened. And so we returned probably about a month ago, we returned to face-to-face -face teaching. And um, yeah, I think almost all of our courses now except one are running face-to-face um, -face on campus. So it, it's a careful, cautious journey, you know, hastening slowly is yeah, really how we think slowly. about it. Well, but yes. yeah, it's it, it's starting to return to not normal, normal as we knew it will never happen again. But um, there are benefits from what we've been through, but um, certainly different, but we're back in class. So that's that's been a relief. Dr. Michelle, if we could talk about admissions now. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned a, a few words that I'd, I'd love to unpack. You mentioned that the class is carefully curated and that they, they all know what the purpose is of why they're there. So yeah, could you talk a bit more about you know, what those fit qualities are that you're really looking for to make this a special MBA program? Yeah. So for us diversity is key so we're trying to curate a cohort that are you know representative of the world's nations and regions that's really important so obviously we prioritize students from underrepresented regions and nations and indeed we we have tr we do a lot of travel and outreach around the world to try and, and get students from from all of the countries that we can we're really looking at widening the diversity talent pool. So we're very interested in leadership that it might be underrepresented. So we're big supporters of the, the military, of those who serve their country. So we have scholarships for uh, military leaders to come and do their MBA. And we have a lot of scholarships for women. And we have scholarships for elite athletes. So we're very interested in looking for people who come from different leadership backgrounds. Those from NGOs, um, people from NGOs are of great interest to us. Public sector, you know, public servants are, are really important. Um, so just coming from diverse industries and backgrounds is really important. When I say fit, I think the fit is almost not fitting. So it's, it's bringing unique talents and skills and backgrounds. What really matters, I think, is a sense of purpose, a sense of wanting to be part of something bigger than yourself, a sense of wanting to serve and, you know, create a legacy and and do something for the community. So there's a difference between someone who's applying whose vision is really quite small and it's focused on their next paycheck, their next promotion. It's important everyone needs to see a financial return from an MBA. People need to be able to see progression and achievement. But I think if you can see a way of contributing beyond just your own immediate life and, and your story, that is really empower, really powerful to us, really important, and, and that's something that we're looking for. Diversity of thought and experience. and. And actually, I think the evidence is something that people really underestimate. So it's it's very easy to talk about things you might like to do, but when you can show evidence of achievement and progression, and that doesn't mean you have to have changed the world, but we need to be able to see that you've had some grit and determination that you have been involved, that you are a doer, you're someone who's got involved in stuff and made stuff happen. That's very powerful to us. Even in your own small community, if you've built something, if you've empowered others and made things happen, and you can show evidence of that, that's really important. So I think avoiding a small vision and just references from peers is, is probably the thing that you want to avoid. And the thing that you want to do is having been involved in things and making things happen, having vision, having references from people who have known you and seen your great work and will, will testify to you is really important to us. Oh, that's, I just, yeah, I wanted you to keep on going. <laughs> that's great. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I did notice that your the average profile of your class skews a bit older in terms of age and experience. Is that intentional? And 
yeah, do you prefer people with, you know, upwards on average, of course, upwards of seven years of experience? Not for the full-time program. Full-time programs are usually a little younger around the world. I would say that ours is a little older. And I think that's probably a function of us wanting people who've had a few years experience at work. And you will get more benefit from your MBA if you've been in the workforce for a few years. So we're looking for at least a few years work experience. And, and that can be as a founder working in startups or in NGOs. But I think a few years is really important for it, for the learning to be meaningful and for you to contribute something meaningful to the cohort. But after a few years, we certainly wouldn't say you need to have seven years. And generally, an MBA is going to have a bigger impact on your career trajectory if you do it a little earlier on. So by the time you're three to five years out of your undergraduate degree, that's a really good time to start thinking about an MBA. And um, we'd be happy to see you from that point. Having said that, we have plenty of 40-year-olds, even 50-year-olds in the program who you know, have been really busy with their career and they want to take a step back and really invest in themselves and, and regroup and think about themselves themselves and double down on some areas that they want to develop more subject matter expertise and thought leadership in. And how does your, you know, how do you guys look at the GMAT score? Like what is your philosophy in, in terms of using it as part of your admissions process? And yeah. Yeah. So look, GMAT's important because it calibrates globally. And to that point, we actually will look at a couple of other tests as well. So okay. if you've done the, the entrance for medicine or law, um, we, we look at those and we say, okay, that, that is a globally calibrated standardized test of ability. So we always have um, a few doctors in the program because we'll look at GAMSAT and UMAT. So if you've done those kinds of standardized tests for professional entry into medicine or law would be interested. But it is, it is important to globally calibrate achievement and we, we definitely look at that. It also helps if your undergraduate track record is a bit patchy. And, you know, some of the world's high achievers have got pretty patchy undergraduate records. So it's okay if you have got some bumpy grades there in that undergrad transcript if you've then got a really strong GMAT. There's another group there, and that's people that we give GMAT waivers to. And that happens in a couple of ways. One, it happens at the end of the year. So from about October onwards, we do get some great people pop up who haven't got a GMAT. And at that point, we would consider that there isn't enough time left to prepare for a good GMAT score. So if we are really interested and we think they make a really compelling candidate from there, leadership experience, their professional background and achievements, and they can demonstrate academic excellence through their other transcripts, then we would look at a GMAT waiver. But it would not make you eligible for a scholarship. Um, the GMAT really helps us to evaluate scholarships equitably. The other thing about a GMAT is we do give waivers for extraordinary candidates. So when we say extraordinary candidates, you know, decorated military leaders. Last year, we had the the head of a TV network, a national TV network, a chief of staff, um, candidates like that who bring something extraordinary to the cohort. We would look at them and think, well, they are bringing a lot to that cohort. The other students are going to benefit enormously from learning alongside them. So, in those cases, we, we might uh, give a GMAT waiver. But by and large, if you are interested in being considered for a scholarship, you would need to get a good GMAT score. Yes. And are you looking for any minimums from any section, whether that's the quant or AWA, IR, you know? Yeah. Look, not from any section because we, we kind of think that leadership and high achievement are, are multidimensional. You can get through with some slightly sketchy quant skills if you're, you know, really, really incredibly strong um, in other areas. So we try not to look too much at the individual scores and focus on the overall score. It would be very hard to get an offer from our program below 600, really 650. 
is kind of the minimum that we we start looking at. But again, you know, if you are someone that brings diversity to the cohort, then that could be different. So if you're a student from a really underrepresented country, we would absolutely look at that. You know, from a country in the developing world, that would be of, of real interest. If you're a student from an applicant from a, a very underrepresented industry sector, then then we would try and look more closely at that or maybe from an NGO and we might look at that. And that, that would be something we could consider as, as a whole of application um, thing. Thank you so much for just kind of breaking that down in a very straightforward way. I'm, I'm sure our listeners will really appreciate that. <laughs> Could, could we also talk about your interview process? Because I, I had some questions there. So I noticed you guys do video essays. And then there's this potential more formal interview, which is longer, or a brief interview, which is shorter. And so, yeah, could you kind of um, walk us through those? Sure. So once we've got your application, your completed application package, we'll decide who to put through to our, our kind of round one interview, which is our Kira interview. And um, I think your, your listeners will be familiar with the Kira platform if they've applied to some of the other leading schools. And you, it's essentially a, you know, video platform where you get given a bunch of questions with just a, a couple of minutes to prepare your answer and, and then you've got to stand and deliver. So we get a lot out of seeing that because it really speaks to students' leadership skills, their, their professional skills, their ability to communicate persuasively and to think on their feet and present on their feet with, with very little notice. So it mimics a lot of what we might see in a normal leadership career. So a panel will evaluate your Kira interview and then based on that, you would get through to the interview. And that's the second interview, and that's a face-to-face -face or a Zoom interview um, with a panel. And then we'll just drill down on, on different aspects of your application and really get to know you well, but also give you the chance to get to know us well. And, and who conducts those interviews? The admissions team? And or? That, yep. So that would be uh, I interview every candidate, All evaluate right. every candidate. <laughs> it's kind of like a family. And funnily enough, when you're in a very small program, you actually really want to know that that there is a, a kind of a, a few things are there. So we're looking for growth mindset and learning orientation. Humility is really important to us. It's, it's very important to Australians in general. Australians don't take themselves that seriously. And just a, a kind of a warm, friendly, welcoming person. Because we're going to spend a lot of time together and we want to know that that we have really good people in, in our family. So yeah, that's that's really the interview process. And then you don't need to apply for scholarships separately. We evaluate every applicant for a scholarship automatically and you'll get the offer of a place in the cohort and an offer of a scholarship if you've been successful at the same time. And we try and turn those around within a kind of two week turnaround. Whoa, the whole decision or the, the scholarship decision? Once you've been through your final interview with us, you'll hear back from us within a couple of weeks. Wow. Yeah, that's fantastic. So, I mean, I have to ask you a little bit more about those interviews. <laughs> sure. So, you know, I'm sure you've done so many of them now. And yeah. I'm, I'm wondering if you could just offer some tips to help people who are preparing for them, right? So that you, they can make the most out of that time to, yeah. to show you all those things you mentioned, but also to, to make it easier for, for you and your team, right? To see how they might fit with the program. Like, I don't know, maybe you could give some tips there. Yeah. Look, I, I think in a way, don't, over prepare. It's very clear when a candidate has spent a lot of time on websites and um, trawling answers because you hear the same words uh, and phrases and yeah. sentences over and over and over again. So really trying to find what is authentic and unique and special about you and understanding that before you go into an interview is really going to help. We're not looking for perfect human beings. You don't need to be perfect, but be authentic try and be yourself and really learn to tell your narrative well. So, so learn to tell the, the arc of your experience so far and include warts and all. Things go wrong 
and we want to hear that things have gone wrong. If nothing's gone wrong, then you probably haven't learned an awful lot of lessons yet. And I, I really think that you're not really ready to lead until you've lost some skin on the ground. So we actually want to hear that you've coped with some stuff that life's thrown at you. And you've walked away and you've grown from it and, and learned some things. So be prepared to tell your story. Obviously, you know, don't don't share, don't overshare. <laughs> but please share your authentic journey without needing to turn it into a, a litany of things that went wrong. Just, you know, this is what what I've um, experienced. These are the steps that I've taken. I, I went from here to here by managing to do this. These are, are my achievements. These are the challenges that I've faced along the way. You know, here's where I mucked up. You know, be honest. I probably, that wasn't my finest hour. <laughs> what did I learn from that? You know, I, I learned this about myself. I realized I'd done that before. I was you know, pretty keen not to, to let that happen again. And here's how I was different afterwards. You know, here's how I grew as a leader. Talk about the things that shaped you, the people, the experiences, the places. I think when someone can pull you in with a truly authentic journey, that's really, really engaging. Evidence and detail is hugely important. You will get a lot of people who'll say that they've been involved in an educational charity is, is classic. Um, and on one hand, you know, of course, that that's music to our ears. We're passionate about that too, but, but really make it authentic. Don't, don't feel like talking about the same things. Talk about things where you made a difference, things that are unique and authentic with evidence and, and, Make sure that that stuff is backed up in your references too, so that you're telling a really coherent story. And they're the people that you remember in your, you know, as, as an interviewer, I think when people let you into their life a little bit and, and you're really hearing and seeing that person and they let you in, that's just incredibly powerful. So be yourself and celebrate what you've done and your achievements with us. Oh, gosh. Such fantastic advice. Uh, thank you. I want to make like just a special mini episode based on that. But um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I know we're running short on time here. So I have um, a couple more questions. The first is, which I guess is still a little bit admissions related, is how focused do you expect applicants' career goals to be? Like how focused do they need to be in terms of post MBA direction? Yeah, look, it's useful when someone comes in with a vision, with a dream, because you can hear that and think, yep, that sounds achievable and, and I know how we can help you achieve it. So you'll get someone who comes in and they'll say, my passion is renewables. I want to make a contribution. I'm not sure how or where or what I'll do, but I want to, uh, renewables is just, I see it as my purpose. And that's incredibly exciting because, you know, you're already thinking ahead to the companies they can work with and the projects they can work on. So that that is wonderful. More commonly, we'll hear them say, I want to work in management consulting for, for this cup for McKinsey normally. And that's great, but it's, it is a slightly narrow vision. And I've heard people say, I want to work for the the global division of McKinsey because I want to work in the developed world because I'm a you know really passionate about this aspect and and that's that's exciting um, because that's more of a vision than just I want to be on the payroll of that organization it's also fine to say I don't know how I'm going to make a contribution I'm not sure how I fit in and that's what's led me to this door because I know that if I spend this year and a half with you I'll figure it out but at that point, it's important to say the things that excite you and that you love and that you hope might feature into your future. So generally saying, I, I, you know, I'm just not sure what I want to do is maybe not as compelling as I'm not sure how to make a contribution. But these are the skills and talents that I think I can bring to bear. And these are the, the aspects of life that I'm passionate about. Amazing. And what makes... AGSM really special from a career perspective. And and if you wouldn't mind talking about maybe some trends in your student placement as well, I'd be really curious to know. Yep. So the trends bits 
really easy for us. Our, our big employers are number one consulting. You won't be surprised to hear. And tech. Tech is a huge employer for us. So, you know, Uber, Google, Amazon. And we're starting to get, you know, groups like um, Antler and startups, some of the AI startups. Um, so, consulting, tech and finance would still be a big recruiter for us. Increasingly, um, just that whole startup sector, um, a lot more students are now arriving, wanting to work in startups and leaving in startups. So that's exciting. I think what's really exciting about AGSM from a recruitment point of view, and I don't think people often realize this, but if you do the math, we have 50 students in the program and we're in Sydney with many, many, many companies recruiting from the program. So, you know, sometimes the exchange students who are coming in from Chicago Booth, Kellogg, Wharton, they'll say to me, part of the reason we're on exchange is we think it would be easier to get hired by McKinsey when they've only got a program of 50 students to be getting recruited from, because when they come see us at our school, there's 2,000 in the room. And so, I do think that's that's a difference. You know, if you go to the recruitment session with McKinsey here, there might be 40 people uh, in the room. You know, and I, I was looking at the stats for consulting week, which just wrapped up. And, and I think the interesting stat there is we had 82 representatives from recruit from companies recruiting. And the largest student audience that we had at any one time, because we have students from our executive MBA as well in the room, so there were 82 industry representatives there to hire and the largest crowd of students at any one time was 82 students. So, it, you know, the, the dynamics there are pretty favorable if you're looking to stand out and get some FaceTime, some one-on-one -on -one time to chat to recruiters. Being part of a small program is, is a phenomenal advantage. Wow. Yeah. I mean... <laughs> Oh, well, you've got me really excited about the program. I, I, I just want to thank you so much for, for sharing your insights. Uh, this has been a really, really great episode. Thank you so much, Dr. Michelle, for, for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you, Darren. Thank you so much for having me and, and giving me some time to talk to you about AGSM. Thanks for listening to the Touch MBA podcast. Don't be shy. We have a mailing list. Go to touchmba.com and get yourself signed up. And we'll keep you posted with the best tips and insider interviews on how to get into your number one school. You can also find us on Twitter and Facebook at Touch MBA. See you soon.